uh, it's a privilege to be giving this talk and as mentioned before my name is Joyce and I'm a lecturer at UNSW. Uh, so just before we start uh, with the talk I'll, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about myself and how I got to where I am. So I completed a Bachelor of Medical Science and a Master's of Research both at Macquarie University and uh, I started teaching anatomy as a tutor in the lab first and then I worked my way up to lecturing and then eventually I ran the anatomy program for the Faculty of Science and taught uh, allied health students. And this year I moved to UNSW where I lecture now and luckily I get to work with really great people like Kelly. And uh, at the same time, I also am in the progress of completing my PhD. My research area is around body donation and medical ethics as well and a bit of education as well. So this is what we will be talking about today. We'll start off really basic. We'll first talk about what the urinary bladder is because the most important thing to do in anatomy is to orientate ourselves, to know where we are in the body, to know what we are talking about and to create a frame of reference that we'll always come back to. And then we'll talk about what the urinary bladder actually looks like. So the gross anatomy. So with the naked eye, what does the urinary bladder look like? And then what is the bladder made of? So under the microscope, what kind of cells do we see? How does that make sense in terms of the function of the bladder? And is it designed well? And then we'll talk about how the urinary bladder actually develops. So this is the branch of anatomy that we term as embryology. So this is the development of both the embryo and the fetus. And this can be a bit overwhelming, but hopefully uh, I've made it very uh, easy to understand tonight. And then, of course, we'll end with how the urinary bladder actually works in terms of its micturition uh, reflex, so voiding and emptying the bladder. <clears throat> and feel free to pop your questions in the chat, or you can also ask your question over the mic, I don't mind, uh, and we can answer them as we go. So, what is the urinary bladder? So, we know that the urinary bladder is going to be part of the urinary system, it's, uh, and the urinary system's function is to produce urine. Now, can anyone type in the chat and tell me what organs constitute the urinary system? What do we have? Yeah, we've got two kidneys for the most part. For most people, we've got a right and a left kidney. The kidneys, generally speaking, their main function is to produce urine. And then we have the ureters where these little tubes that the urine will actually flow through and the ureters will connect to what organ? What do we think? Yeah, the urinary bladder. And then we have an extension of the urinary bladder, which we know as the urethra, which allows us uh, or gives uh, a passageway for urine to actually void or exit into the external environment. And hopefully that's a toilet. Uh, and the urinary bladder is also a hollow organ with a strong muscular wall, and it's characterized by its ability to distend. Now, what does that mean? Its ability to distend that makes sense. We need an organ if it's going to store, if its main function is to store urine, we need that organ to be able to stretch and to accommodate to uh, that change. And this is a very common thing that we'll see in anatomy. The structure will always reflect the function. And this is why anatomy is so important because it allows us to ask ourselves, okay, well, if we find these cells here, if this organ is, you know, shaped the way it is, does that make sense in terms of its function? And most of the time that will foreshadow itself. Can I say something uh, before you go on, Joyce? Um, so interesting, you know, with um, the standing, the extension of the bladder. So if for whatever reason your bladder gets a scarred or damaged, so in having surgery, having a TRBT done, having a lot of biopsies can cause scarring in the tissue and may limit the distension of the bladder. In the same way, any ke uh, chemotherapy that's put into your bladder can also cause inflammation and scarring. And that may limit the distension of your bladder. And if there's a limitation to that, that may lead to symptoms such as pain or needing to void frequently because you don't have the same capacity as what you used to. Sorry, Joyce. That's all right. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, just to also finish off with this slide, this is some terminology and orientation that I'll probably be referring to uh, within this uh, talk tonight. So we have the body here and it's in anatomical position. So this is our frame of reference in terms of where we describe structures are and how they're related to each other. We have a midline that divides the body into an equal right and left. 
And anything towards the midline, we describe it as being medial. And anything that's away from the midline, so going outside the body, we describe it as lateral. Anything that's in front to whatever frame of reference you're referring to, we refer to it as anterior. And anything that's at the back, we refer to it as posterior. And again, I'll just define what these terms are as we go, but I'll most likely refer to them as anterior or posterior, just out of habit. So if we have a look at the gross anatomy of the bladder, of the urinary bladder, we can see that we have two diagrams. We can see that we have a mid-sagittal diagram of the pelvic cavity, meaning that we've divided the pelvis into an equal right and left, and we're looking at one side only. Now, again, to orientate you, this here is at the front, so anterior, and then this here is at the back. What we notice is we have the reproductive organs as well. So what do we think? Is this a female or a male pelvic cavity? Any ideas? Yeah, female. So let's start and work our way from the posterior aspect. So from the back and go towards the front. So towards the back, we have a, a, a triangular shaped bone, which is the sacrum. And as we make our way anteriorly, we start to find the visceral organs. So the actual, uh, you know, organs. We find the uh, most distal part of the large colon, which is the rectum and ends as the anal canal. And as we move our way anteriorly, we find the female reproductive tract. We find the vaginal canal, the cervix, and then the uterus, the uterine tubes, and then the ovaries. Anterior to this, or rather inferior and anterior to the uterus, we find the urinary bladder. And we also notice that the urinary bladder is directly in front of the vaginal canal in the biological female. What we notice as well is the bladder, the urinary bladder is triangular in shape when it's empty. It has a little apex. So if we just imagine the triangle being this way, we, oops. We have an apex, a pointy bit of the bladder, and we have a fibrous structure that's attaching to uh, the region of the umbilicus uh, on our anterior abdominal wall, so where our abs lie. So this here is what we call the uracus. And the uracus in development used to be a little tube that allowed for the fetus to get rid of nitrogenous waste through the placenta and through the umbilical cord. If we move posteriorly now, so we we finished with the apex and its relations, we come Can across- Can I interrupt? The... George, yes. sorry. I don't know if you're going to talk about it later, but just some of you may have heard of uh, some some very rare form of cancer the, of the uracus. You can get bladder cancer in this uh, remaining uracus. Sorry, I can't point. But what Joyce pointed out, the yellow structure there, um, that, ca that can develop a cancer adenocarcinoma of the bladder. Um, it's very rare. Um, and uh, obviously, it also gets treated with a cystectomy. Sometimes it may need chemotherapy as well. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was from what Joyce has said, look how close all the structures are together, the, the, the rectum, the vagina, the urethra. That's why females are very um, prone to getting urinary tract infections compared to males. Who, who don't have such a close relation of these structures. And that's why we always tell women to wipe from front to back rather than back to front. So you don't take the pathogens from the rectum and put it into the bladder. Carry on, Joyce. Sorry if I'm interrupting you all the time. That's all right. So yes, so as Kelly was saying, these structures have a very close and intimate relationship together. And we can appreciate that in some surgical procedures, why all of these structures need to be considered with management or surveillance. And we also have the uh, body of the urinary bladder over here, and then we have the fundus as well. And as mentioned before, we also have this passageway, this extension of the urinary bladder, which allows us to void the urine that's stored within the bladder uh, into the external environment. And this structure here is the urethra. Now, if we just translate this diagram and look at this one over here, so what we've done, instead of uh, you know, dividing the urinary bladder into an equal right and left side, we are taking the whole bladder and we're looking at it from the back and we've cut away the most posterior aspect. And what we notice is this drape over here. Now, if we think about what organs lie superior or at the top of all of these organs, so the bladder, the uterus and the rectum, you'll find our digestive system or um, parts of the digestive system. And the digestive system is covered in such a way that you can imagine 
uh, almost like sausage like structures that are covered with cling wrap. And this cling wrap drapes down the pelvic cavity and it contours the crevices of the organs within the pelvic cavity. So, like so. And it drapes over the top aspect or the superior aspect of the urinary bladder. And this is what we call the peritoneum. And the peritoneum will carry vasculature and lymph nodes as well. Uh, and from the posterior aspect of the urinary bladder as well, we can see the uh, the structure that's actually going to store the urine. And this is what we call the rugae. And the rugae is folded. It's very curly. And this is the structure that's going to distend when we are uh, storing urine within the bladder. And then what we notice, there's a difference between this and this. This triangular shaped structure looks quite smooth and is very different from the rugae of the urinary bladder. And this acts like a little slide. So we don't want, we don't want folds in this section here because if the urine is flowing down uh, through this area, which is called the trigone and trigone just translates to a triangle, we don't want urine to start uh, getting caught up between these different folds and these different curls. So we want this to be a smooth uh, lining. And we also want the urethra to be relatively smooth as well. So this here is the trigone. And then these here are the openings of the tubes that drain from uh, the kidney to the urinary bladder, which are the uh, ureteric orifices. So the openings of the ureters. And if we keep moving down inferiorly, what we find is this structure over here, which translates to this square over here and this square over here. Altogether, this is what we call the urogenital diaphragm. Urogenital diaphragm because it connects some parts of the urinary system with some parts of the reproductive system. But what's really important about this in the context of the bladder is that it contains a, a skeletal muscle that under conscious control, we can contract or we can relax, which plays a very important role, of course, in micturition, so voiding the bladder. So this here in the urogenital diaphragm is the external anal, uh, urethral sphincter. And if we think about that name, it's external, it's urethral, and it's a sphincter. So it's a, it's a little ring that wraps around the urethra. And we also have the word external in there, which indicates to us that we have to have an internal urethral sphincter. This is our frame of reference that I spoke about before. So our internal anal sphincter, we need to move our way up in the bladder. So we go up or we go superiorly rather, and we find it around this region here, around the neck of the bladder. And it's usually a continuation of the smooth muscle that we find in the bladder, the detrusor muscle, will collect and uh, make a fibrous structure that mimics a sphincter. And this is what we term as an internal urethral sphincter. So in answer to the quiz, two sphincters, internal and external urinary sphincter. That's right. Now, obviously we all know that there are going to be differences between the biological female and the biological male uh, urinary bladder, but more so the urethra. So let's have a look at the differences between the two sexes. So this view over here, again, we're looking at the urinary bladder from the back and we've cut away the most uh, posterior aspect or the most back part. Uh, and we're looking at it from the inside. And this here is what we call a coronal view. And if we think about it and the way that I like to think about coronal views, it's almost like you have a piece of bread or a loaf of bread rather, and you cut it into slices from front to back. And this is what a coronal view is. So this is what we're looking at. So over here, of course, where we have the uh, female uh, urinary bladder over here, a coronal view. Again, we have this empty structure here, the lumen of the urinary bladder, and we have the different folds, the rugae. We have the trigone, and then we have the internal urethral sphincter around the neck. And then as we move down in the urethra, we have the external urethral sphincter just extending from that urogenital diaphragm. Now, with the female urinary bladder, posterior to the urethra, we're going to have the vaginal opening over here, and we have the vulva as well as the external genitalia. Now, what we notice as well, and what we notice the difference is between a female and a male urinary bladder is that the urethra is quite short in the female, whereas in the male, it's quite long. So if it's quite long, it means that it's gone uh, different almost embryological development. It's going to be surrounded by different structures. Therefore, there's going to be different naming uh, of the different parts of the urethra. So I'm going to just quiz you. What do we think this is, this area here? What do we find here? 
Any ideas? So would this part be smooth or would it be folded? The part above the ureter, where the ureters come out basically. Yeah. So these parts here would be folded. So this here is the rugae. This is what's going to stretch. Yep, yeah, that's right. And then as we move down into this smooth area where we have the two openings of the ureters, we have the trigon over here. And this aspect here is quite smooth. We have the muscle or the muscular layer of the bladder, which we'll get to in a second as well. And some of the muscle fibers will come together to give us the internal urethral sphincter around the neck of the bladder. And as we move distally, we start to get a different part of the urethra. And this part of the urethra is surrounded by this gland. Does anyone know what gland this is? Any ideas? Yes, this is the prostate gland. So this aspect, this purple part is the prostate gland. And medial to it, so inside the prostate gland, we find the prostatic urethra over here. Then we keep moving distally and we come across this purple structure again. And this uh, aspect here is the urogenital diaphragm. And what sphincter did we find in the urogenital diaphragm? What do we think? So would it be internal or external? Yeah, we find the external urethral sphincter in the urogenital diaphragm. So this is what we call the membranous urethra. And then as we move our way into uh, the shaft of the penis, we come across the penile urethra or the spongy urethra. And this part of the urethra is surrounded by that erectile tissue of the penis. Now, this aspect here is the navicular fossa. And this has a different embryological origin than the rest of the, the uh, urethra. So keep that in mind when we come across embryology. Now, to get an appreciation of how the prostate gland surrounds the uh, urethra, the prostatic urethra, we need to have a look at a sagittal view or a lateral view of the bladder. So over here, we have a lateral view of the bladder. So we've taken the bladder, we've taken the prostate, and now we're just looking at it from the side. And this diagram over here is a mid-sagittal diagram. So what we've done is we've cut this uh, diagram into an equal right and left, and we're looking at the inside aspects of it. Is everyone with me so far? Yeah? Okay, great. So over here, we have the anterior aspect. So again, we're at the front. And then over here, we are in the posterior aspect. So here, we're at the back. We have this triangular shape or this uh, pointy part of the urinary bladder. This is the apex. And from the apex, we have this uracus over here. So this fibrous attachment that used to be a tunnel during fetal development almost remains a tunnel uh, during development, during the development of a child. And then as a child grows into an adult, it starts to regress into that fiber-like structure. And that's why stimulating the umbilicus or stimulating the belly button will usually cause the child to micturate or to void their bladder. So if we uh, go back to the apex of the urinary bladder and see what structures we have on the posterior aspect. We have the vas deferens over here, which is unique in the biological male. And then we also have the seminal vesicles. These two respectively will carry the sperm and the seminal fluid. And what they'll do, they'll insert themselves into the prostate gland. So if we come across this diagram over here and we just translate what we just did, again, we have the apex over here. So this tells us that we're at the front. And then we have the posterior aspect, which tells us that we're at the back. And we have two relations. We have this ductus vas deferens, and then we have the seminal vesicles. Both of these uh, have little channels that we call ducts or little tunnels. And they connect in the prostate gland and give us the ejaculatory duct. So when a male uh, ejaculates, we don't want this ejaculate to backflow into the urinary bladder. So we have this internal urethral sphincter that closes and prevents that backflow. But if there was backflow, the male or the gentleman will just uh, void that out when necessary. So again, if we have a look at the different parts of the urethra, we have this part of the urethra that's just before, that's just at the top of the prostate. So we call this the pre-prostatic urethra. And then this part of the urethra that's in between the prostate gland, the, the right and the left side of the prostate gland, this is what we call the prostatic urethra.
All right. Now, to appreciate what kind of structures support the urinary bladder in both sexes, in both the female and the male, we need to understand the concept of what a pelvic floor is. So in this diagram, we have the pelvis. We have the two hip bones, and then we have that sacrum that we saw in that mid-sagittal diagram, that little triangle bone at the end of our vertebral column. Our pelvis is, has a little basin. And think of it as a tissue box. So inside where the, tissue, uh, where the tissues are in the tissue box, this is our pelvic floor. And the external aspect of the tissue box, so let me show you, tissue box. We have the pelvic floor that's on the inside. And then we have something that we call the perineum, which is on the outside. And this outside aspect is going to carry our external genitalia. So the penis or the vagina. So... If we have a look at this diagram over here, this is the tissue, right? This is that basin that creates, that is created uh, around the pelvic floor. And this is the pelvic floor muscles or most of them. And if there is a loss in tonicity or if there is weakness due to trauma, such as a vaginal birth, uh, you are likely to lose the support that these muscles provide to the urethra. So this can occur in uh, conditions like stress uh, incontinence. And if we have a look further at what Can I interrupt other you? Support? Yeah, sure. One other thing. The other thing is obviously surgery, any form of pelvic surgery, whether it be to the bowel, whether it be removal of the prostate or prostatectomy, um, in woman removal of the uterus, hysterectomy, any, any of those surgeries can damage or there can be nerve damage that supply those muscles and can cause weakness. Um, and then that can obviously, as, just, as Joyce said, lead to incontinence or in some cases, even prolapse of some of the organs down, um, such as the uterus or um, the bowel. Go on. I gave you a chance to have a sip. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and hang on. I just closed the chat. Let me get that back up. And if we have a look now at the other side of it, so the perineum. So remember, inside the tissue box was the pelvic floor and outside was the perineum. And the perineum is best seen if we take the pelvis and we look at it from the top or we look at it from the, its, its inferior aspect. And we have the perineal muscles. We have some muscles that contribute fibers that further support this urethral orifice over here. So... If I just translate this diagram to that, we have the pubic symphysis, which is this structure here. And then we have the two ischial tuberosities, the two bony parts that we actually sit on when we sit on a chair. And then we have the coccyx, our tailbone. Uh, over here, we have the external anal sphincter in the back, so in the anal triangle. And then in the front, we have the urogenital triangle. So part of the urinary system and part of uh, the reproductive system or the external genitalia. So again, we have some muscles that contribute muscle fibers that surround the urethra and further support uh, our ability to maintain a urine within the bladder if we don't want to micturate. <clears throat> now, we've talked about the gross anatomy of the urinary bladder, and now we should talk about the histology. So what the bladder is actually made of and how it looks like under the microscope. Now, to get an appreciation of the different parts of the bladder wall and, you know, the different aspects of the histology of the bladder, we first need to go back to biology or come to biology if we've never been and talk about the basic structure of a cell. So over here, we have a cell and we have trillions of cells in the body. And these cells can adapt and can be different shapes depending on the needs of these organs. And... We have this part of the cell over here, which is the nucleus. This is the CEO. We have organelles of the cell. So these are like the organs of the actual cell that are found all over the cell. And we have different concentrations of organelles in all different cells in the body. We have this structure over here, which produces proteins or parts of proteins. It produces them and then it spits them out. And then it sends them to this blue structure over here. And this blue structure is like the post office of the cell. And this is that Golgi apparatus, if you're interested to look that up. So this here is the post office of the cell. It receives whatever this green structure spits out. It packages the protein 
and it gets it ready to exit the cell. And this is important when we look at the bladder because parts of the bladder or cells of the bladder, bladder will secrete this glycoprotein layer, this honey-like structure that surrounds the lumen of the bladder to protect it. So if we have a look at the histology of the bladder, and this slide is very overwhelming, so we'll just focus on one image at a time. We are very familiar with this diagram over here, this uh, coronal section of a female bladder. We have the rugae, the folding of the bladder, and then we have the trigone over here. And then we have this light orange layer. This layer is the most intimate with this lumen. It's the most intimate with whatever is actually stored within the bladder. And then we have the muscular layer as well. So when we have hollow organs, we have a lining of this uh, balloon. So if you think about a balloon and you, uh, you know, you blow a balloon, the inside layer is lined with a bunch of cells. And this is what we call the epithelium. And the epithelium in the urinary bladder is organized in such a way that it can distend. So this is that first slide that we spoke about. The structure of the organ will foreshadow the function. So the cells that make up the bladder can actually stretch. And it makes sense. We don't want it to be just one volume all the time. We want it to be able to adapt to the liquid that's draining in it. So over here, we have the in, inside aspect. So this here would be the lumen. And this is where urine will flow. And then over here, we have the outer aspect. So the outside. So we are moving this way in this slide. So the first layer is going to be our mucosal layer. And this is going to carry that epithelium and some of the connective tissue. Now, what's really important and what's really interesting about this layer is this top layer over here, these umbrella-like structures. These here are the apical parts or the apical layer of the transitional epithelium, also known as the urothelium. So the epithelium that surrounds the urinary bladder. These cells, can we see how they're jagged? These almost interlock with each other to create junctions that are quite tight. And it makes total sense. Again, let's think about the function of the urinary bladder. It's to store urine, it's to act as a reservoir. And if it's storing urine, we don't really want urine to start leaking its way through the walls of the urinary bladder. So we need to have this lock in mechanism or these tight junctions. And as we move down, or outside rather, to these cells over here, these basal cells, these are the cells that, are, that will replenish the epithelium as these cells die off. Now, what's really important about epithelium and epithelium around the whole body, not just the urinary bladder, is that it's avascular. It lacks blood supply. But let's think about it. They're still cells. They're still living cells. So of course they need blood supply. And of course we need to supply them with nutrition. So we have connective tissue that connects blood vessels to this epithelium that allows for these cells to be nourished and allows for these cells to, um, you know, secrete their waste into the bloodstream as well. So we have blood vessels that, uh, that attach or that connect from the connective tissue to the epithelium. And if we think about this in the context of bladder cancer, if we have cancer cells that are embedded within this epithelium, they can easily access the bloodstream and they can easily access uh, the lymphatic system as well. Now, as we move down into this layer over here, this muscularis layer, we have smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is one of three types of muscles that we have in the body. Smooth just refers to the fact that it's not under voluntary control. It's not under our conscious control. We don't really think, okay, I'm going to stretch my bladder now and I'm not going to stretch my bladder now. So smooth muscle, again, is not under our conscious control, but it has these three different parts in the urinary bladder. We have an inner layer, we have a middle and an outer layer. But these layers are so chaotic when it comes to the urinary bladder. They're just all over the shop. They don't organize themselves very well like they do in other organs, except for around the neck. And we can appreciate why it doesn't really matter what layer of uh, muscle the cancer invades because that's not going to change treatment. And I'm sure Kelly can speak more to this as well. And as we move to the outside, we also have something that we call the adventitia or the connective tissue layer that surrounds the bladder, surrounds the whole bladder, except for this top bit here. 
this top bit here. And remember, this top bit was that cling wrap that draped from the digestive system, that peritoneum, and it lined that superior aspect of the bladder. So if we translate this cartoon image to an actual slide of the urinary bladder, and we look at a histological slide, we can see it over here. We can see that we have the inside aspect at the top. So we have the lumen and remembering that the lumen is what's going to store the urine. And then as we move outside, <clears throat> this here is that connective tissue layer, that glossy layer, that connective tissue layer that's suspending the bladder to surrounding structures. We have this epithelium, we have the connective tissue, and then we have the muscle layer as well. And if we have a look at an even closer image of this epithelium, we can appreciate that the lumen is here. So this empty space where urine can potentially uh, uh, sit in and be stored. We have the urothelium or the epithelium. And what do we think? Do you think this bladder at the moment or this section of the bladder is stretched? Is it distended or is it quite relaxed from what we can see? Yeah, it's quite relaxed. It has many layers. It's got five to seven layers on average. And when it gets full or when it starts to be filled with urine, it will stretch out into that two to three layer of cells. So it gets bigger. Nice work. And then we also have, of course, that connective tissue layer where we find the blood vessels that connect uh, blood supply and nourishment to that epithelium, to those epithelial cells. And if we uh, now look at the different staging of the different types of uh, uh, bladder cancer, we can now appreciate the different types and where they actually invade and uh, think about why certain treatments are attributed to certain stages based on what tissue and how deeply they're invading other structures and uh, you know the, the different layers of the urinary bladder. Do you want to say anything about this, Callie? Um, <clears throat> not in too much detail. I mean, obviously, we know that T T2, anything that's T2 and above, it has invaded the muscular layer. So what Joyce just spoke about there, I can't point um, with my mouse, but you can see where T2 is. That's what, the, yeah, where Joyce is pointing there. So that that's where... Anything beyond there it requires a cystectomy or removal of the bladder, and anything to the left of it is can be treated with uh, with all the intravesical treatment. Um, Brian's asking where CIS is. It's the flat uh, carcinoma that Joyce has got in blue at the top. So it just stays. It's just it only in the mucosa. It only it only affects the mucosal layer only. And sometimes this flat carcinoma can either grow out into a papillary tumor, so within the bladder wall, or it can actually go into the actual tissue and invade from inside to out rather than just inside. Yeah, I mean, usually, usually CIS doesn't progress to muscle invasive like other cancers um, do. So it doesn't usually become muscle invasive, um, but it does recur. That's the problem with the CIS, and it is considered high grade, um, which is why it has to be you know, treated fairly aggressively. All right, great. Um, one other thing, I mean, we, we got, we're going to be having a pathologist in our next session. So we're going to go into this in a lot more detail. For now, we just wanted you to see what normal looks like um, so that when we get to abnormal, all of this is going to make sense. Um, so carry on, Joyce, you're doing a fabulous job. All right, thanks. Okay, so now we get to my favorite part of anatomy and we get to talk about the development of the urinary bladder. So we have this little embryo over here and uh, we have the anterior aspect of the embryo. So the front, and then we have the back. This here, this is the connection between the uh, placenta and the embryo via the umbilical cord over here. This here is the aspect that um, was the past kidney. So our kidney goes un uh, undergoes almost like three software updates. It starts off as, you know, it starts off in this area here in the neck and then it regresses. And then this here is that future kidney, uh, the adult kidney or the child kidney. Now, what's really important is not so much the kidneys in this talk, but rather the urinary bladder. And the urinary bladder develops from this blind end over here, which we call the cloaca. Uh, 
And if we follow this cloaca up, this blind end, we follow it up the embryo, we come across a little tube. And this tube is what we call the gut tube. This is where our digestive system and our respiratory system will actually develop from. So we can already see that its embryological function is very intimately related to the digestive system or parts of the digestive system, which also relates to another main theme in anatomy. When something has a very similar embryological function, it will carry usually the same almost origin of nerve supply, same origin of uh, blood supply and same lymphatic drainage. So all of these structures will therefore be somehow related. So again, this here is that gut tube and this distal part here is the cloaca. And we can see that we have two little insertions in this cloaca. We have this future ureter and this, um, what we call a mesonephric duct, which is not that important for tonight. Now, as the embryo develops, we get a septum that is the future septum between the urinary bladder and the rectum. So it's between the urinary bladder and it's between the rectum. So we call so it a urorectal septum. Septum means, it just means a wall. They might not know what septum is. It's a septum is just a wall. Yes. Now, as we watch through this animation, we can see that this wall is invading the space between the future urinary bladder and the future rectum. So what happens now is this part of the cloaca is now free to develop into the urinary bladder. And this part here is free to develop into the rectum. So let's keep watching. So now we're going to focus on this bit here. We can see that this part here, whoops, one second. This part here is that future urinary bladder. And then this part at the back is the future rectum. So this here is that primitive urinary bladder. We can see how the ureter is still attached to that uh, uh, primitive urinary bladder. And then we can see how the urethra is going to form as well. And part of the external genitalia. So over here. And then we get the duct that's going to develop into the uterus if this embryo was to be a female. And if not, this, uh, this duct actually gets regressed or gets suppressed by hormone release and genetic factors as well. Okay. And if I just go back just one more and we relate these colors to these diagrams here, we can get an appreciation of what develops from where. So our urinary bladder, we can see over here, is turns into the urinary bladder from that same tissue. The cloaca turns into the bladder, turns into that uracus, turns into the labia majora and minora in the female and the lower part of the vaginal canal. And also the thing that was divided in the first place, the rectum at the back. Our ureters remain as they are. So this should actually be yellow, not orange. And then we have the erectile tissue as well, forming from this little mountain, this little tubercle that we call the genital tubercle. So if we translate this to the male and we work out what derives from where, again, we can see that from this uh, peachy membrane from the cloaca, again, we have this urinary bladder, we have the rectum. And then what do we, what do we have here? What gland is this? What do we think? Yeah, this is the prostate gland. And we also have that urethra derived from the same place. Now, again, the erectile tissue of the male is derived from that same place, that little mountain that we call the genital tubercle over here. So this orange, this orange part, and also this distal part of the urinary bladder. And we don't really know what the reason is of why this develops from the same place as uh, the erectile tissue. So this navicular fossa over here. But what's important to understand is that the urinary bladder and the rectum and some parts of the genitalia, the external genitalia, will be derived from that same place, from that cloaca. And remembering the cloaca is that extension from that whole gut tube. I'm going to exercise some self-control and stop talking about this now <laughs> because I could go on for a while. Okay. Now, for the last part of this uh, presentation, I want to talk about micturition. And micturition is that ability to void the bladder. And what I'd like to note here is that while this is all very neurological and while there's a lot of, uh, you know, 
science going on behind it, it's also biopsychosocial. And there's a ton of biopsychosocial factors that will play into one's ability to urinate, whether that be the level of stress that one may be experiencing and whether that environment that they want to urinate in is actually appropriate to the person. And everyone will be different. So we have the urinary bladder over here. And just someone remind me, what's this structure over here? What do we think this is? Is this the folded part or the smooth part? Yeah, yeah, great. So this is the folded part. And then this here is that smooth part. We have the mucosa or the epithelium. Remember, this is the lining inside the balloon. And then we have this muscular layer over here. So if I just get a pen and change colors, we have extensions or collections of these smooth muscle fibers. They congregate around the neck of the bladder to give us what sphincter? What do we think? Yeah, these give us the internal urethral sphincter over here. So if I just label that as the IUS, so this here is the internal urethral sphincter. And then as we move our way down in the urethra, we find this diaphragm over here. And this diaphragm, remember, was called the urogenital diaphragm. And inside that, we found what sphincter? Yes, good. The external uh, urethral sphincter. So the EUS. So internal and external. Now, this is an empty bladder so far. So let's put some urine in it. Uh, what color? Like yellow for tradition. <laughs> we'll put in some urine. Now, Yes, Remember, please don't make, it, don't make it red, whatever you do. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no, no. The, the GP is closed. We can't go and see our GP yeah. now. <laughs> so the urinary bladder starts to fill with urine. Now, remember the main function of the urinary bladder or the main characteristics uh, characteristic was its ability to distend, to stretch. So we have something that detects stretch in the urinary bladder. So if the urine starts to fill, we detect this stretch. This stretch or this distension is taken up to a signal in the brain. The brain works it out. It's like, okay, well, we're stretched. What should we do? What, should, what is the appropriate response here and how should we regulate this? So it sends out two kinds of neurons or two kinds of nerves or almost wires. One to tell the urethral sphincter to close and one to tell the uh, external urethral sphincter to close as well. And this also happens when the bladder is relaxed. So this, I'll go back to pink for a second. This here is almost always closed, regardless of the state of the bladder. And this external urethral sphincter is also always closed. And this is what we control, what we control under conscious control. When we start to get a stretch, we start to want to relax this muscle here. So we relax this internal urethral sphincter, but this is not done under our conscious control. This is done by another part of the brain or another part of the nervous system that we call the autonomic nervous system. And I'm sure we've all heard about, you know, this fight or flight or rest and digest or this sympathetic and parasympathetic. This is that autonomic nervous system. It's not under our conscious control. We don't know what's going on. So the autonomic nervous system takes care, takes care of this uh, internal urethral sphincter. It allows it to relax. And it allows it to relax in such a way that now the urine can start to flow through this smooth area over here. And remember, in this smooth area, we don't want faults. Otherwise, the urine is going to get confused. It's not going to know where to go. So it favors gravity and starts to funnel down in the, in the uh, urethra. And then the part of the nervous system that's under our conscious control that we have control over, the somatic nervous system, so soma meaning body, innovates the external urethral sphincter and tells it to relax, or we tell it to relax. We decide that this uh, external urethral sphincter is going to be relaxed because now I would like to urinate. This environment is appropriate for me, so now I can void my bladder. And then it makes its way out. Now, the way that adults differ from children is that this external, this, you know, deciding whether to close the external urethral sphincter hasn't matured yet. So this here 
is what is potty training this maturation of the spinal cord and the maturation of the nervous system eventually the child will start to learn how to control this external urethral sphincter so that's it from me today i'd like to thank you all for listening and i would like to also wish you all the best on your road to recovery thank you